Good afternoon, class. Uh, checking in uh, for uh, some comments that I didn't quite get to. We had such a lively discussion today in class, which is always a wonderful uh, experience to have. Uh, but we didn't get as far into the content that I'd hoped to cover. So uh, I wanted to proceed with Jared Diamond so that we could clear ourselves of our second of the big four environmental historians. And that'll clear the deck so that tomorrow we can spend um, our time together uh, discussing and exploring the contributions of, of uh, Bill Cronin. Uh, so uh, I just, I'll start here. I, I have a snap assessment. Um, this is a, you know, I used to do this with this class where I would sometimes begin class period with a question. So I just left it here um, to sort of see if you could, if pressed, come up with a useful answer uh, to this question. Pardon me. And the question, of course, is how does agriculture relate to um, the level of development and advancement of a society? And hopefully one of the things that you've taken away from your um, experience with Jared Diamond thus far is that he's putting forth the idea that the surplus, meaning the agricultural surplus, that a society can create allows that society the um, opportunity to develop and become more complex, meaning uh, the better that, pardon me, that the farming class can provide society and meet its needs for food, that allows for more butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, and uh, nuclear physicists, and physicians, and college professors, so on and so forth. It frees more people up to engage the, I guess we could say, the uh, layered modes of production. It allows a society to advance from a primary mode of production to secondary, tertiary, and quaternary as we discussed briefly in class today. So anyway, that's that's a roundabout way of how uh, agriculture uh, fits in. We met Jared Diamond today, and then we talked uh, in, in, in rather de detail about him, and you folks had wonderful questions and comments, and we spent most all of our time together engaging Diamond at the level of his proximate factors. And of course, just as a reminder, proximate factors are those surface it's sort of like the observable behaviors or the observable uh, capabilities and capacities that a society possesses. And in the case of the Europeans, who begin to come in contact with the natives of the Western Hemisphere starting in the late 15th century, but of course proceeding with much greater uh, intensity during uh, the early 16th century, the 1500s, uh, we see these proximate factors. And these are the things, these are essentially the advantages that would have been evident to the Native Americans who first welcomed the Spanish um, conquistadores, uh, but then later, very shortly thereafter, sought to um, remove and defend their civilizations and societies from encroachment uh, by the Spanish presence. And so Diamond says, yeah, you can observe these things, these pro proximate or surface factors. Sure, these are the things that appear to have uh, tipped the scale, so to speak, or tipped the balance such that the Europeans were more successful in their encounter with the natives of the Western Hemisphere. But if we settle there, if we settle at the sur surface level, we're missing out on a much more revealing level of analysis that uh, really draws very significantly upon the environmental history uh, of these two different uh, societies and civilizations. And so these are the proximate factors listed. And let me just say on the level of writing, pardon me again, actually let me go back to political organization. Part of the point that Diamond is trying to make is that Europe in the late 1400s was just coming to a moment where it was starting to sort of unify. And a great example of this is actually in the uh, incident of uh, Christopher Columbus approaching uh, uh, 
Ferdinand and Isabel, uh, the king and queen of Castile and Aragon, for the funding to sponsor his famous voyages to the Western Hemisphere. Now, right there, it suggests something interesting. We have two different kingdoms on the Iberian Peninsula coming together in to form something closer to the larger uh, nation country of Spain today. But they were just starting to come together. Um, Ferdinand of Castile and Isabel of Aragon. These are two different kingdoms that come together in the marriage of these two famous people. And then these two people decide, and they're actually very reluctant. Columbus petitions them at least five times, I think it's seven times, before they say yes to his proposal for these, um, of course, um, historic uh, voyages across the Atlantic. And so the political organization, meaning the fact that Europe is starting to form itself into districts and administrative units that are larger and larger, is an important part of the story. And the other thing is, is that when this is done politically, it means that the people of this region of the world, the Iberian Peninsula, are sharing in the expense of sending a voyage like Columbus's across the Atlantic. That was an expensive and risky proposition, right? Sailing across the Atlantic, it had not been done. I mean, I guess technically it had, but it had not been done in such a grand and intentional way up until this moment in world history. And the political organization uh, in Europe was an important part of allowing this voyage, the resources, organization, and planning that was necessary to make it a rather critical success. Similarly, writing has a significant role to play there. Uh, writing, in many ways, is essentially knowledge without a shelf life. <laughs> if you think about that, right? Writing, as Diamond, I think, mentioned briefly in the uh, documentary of the other night, Writing allows for the storage of knowledge. Um, in the native practice, and we'll meet a lot of tribes starting next week, the practice of knowledge was transferred orally from generation to generation. Now there's a little bit ex of an exception there. The Maya, who were a famous civilization of middle America, they possessed writing. The Aztec too, but their writing their writing system was actually quite basic and, and not nearly as sophisticated as the Maya. But European writing is absolutely critical because it allows for the dissemination and passage of past approaches to things, whether it's war, whether it's sailing and maritime passage uh, throughout different parts of the world, whether it's through maps. It's stored knowledge which serves later generations very well. And in the case of Europe, these centuries upon centuries of stored knowledge are now going to be shared and passed along. And this is, um, in part, explains the success that the Spanish have when they arrive in the New World. And they have a tremendous advantage over um, the less sophisticated writing and the less sophisticated political organization of the Americas. Well, now let's proceed to ultimate factors. and. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, ultimate factors are, of course, those underlying factors, those things that the Native Americans couldn't see when Cortez and Pizarro began their, um, to launch their offenses against the uh, Aztec and Inca civilizations, respectively. So one of the statements, a powerful statement that Diamond is making with his um, explanation, his thesis here, is that the Spanish were geographically fortunate. They were lucky, um, not because they were more sophisticated or better than the Aztec or the Tlaxcalans or the Tabascans, uh, but because they were uh, inheritors of millennia of developments that have been taking place in Eurasia 
I'll see if my mouse works here. This will be the test. You guys can tell me. Uh, Eurasia, a landmass that is one massive and also has the tremendous fortune of being based along an east-west axis. And this will, um, I'll be able to explain that a little more. And some of you probably don't even need that explained. So what this means is, is that Eurasia, much of Eurasia and the people therein share similarities of latitude with vast stretches of people on this landmass. Now that might not sound like much of an important piece of information. But if you think about it a little bit longer, it actually is. Because in the Americas, in the Western Hemisphere, a lot of people tend to share meridians of longitude in common with each other because it's, this landmass is based on a north-south axis. But over here, Eurasia, it's east-west. And we could include Africa, but the problem with including Africa is that there's this vast land feature known as the Sahara Desert that really does disrupt. Um, it cuts off sub-Saharan Africa from a lot of its interaction with the Eurasian landmass. So that sort of explains why Africa usually gets left out of this. That also might explain why sub-Saharan Africa today, it's part of it. The other part is the Atlantic slave trade, which is sort of a, you know, a travesty in its own right, but um, that also helps explain why Sub-Saharan Africa is relatively less developed than uh, Eurasia today. So the east-west axis of Eurasia versus the north-south axis of the Americas. What this means is that for thousands of years, because the people of Eurasia shared surprisingly similar latitudes, they also shared developments. They shared and, you know, this would have happened gradually. It wasn't like someone just wandered 100 miles east and said, hey, you guys, guess what? But the nature of things is, is that if they're successful, they tend to be adapted or imitated by people and successful things tend to be replicated and tried in new places. And that's a lot easier to do if you're moving across similar um, levels of latitude, meaning it's easier to travel east-west than north-south. If you think about it, you travel east-west, and I'm being simplistic here, but you're less likely to need a, a different coat. You're less likely to need different um, <laughs> hats, um, coverings for your hands, different boots, because weather and climate tend to be similar as one heads east-west. That's not the same when one moves north-south. So a critical aspect of what Diamond is getting at here is that sharing is much easier in a landmass like Eurasia than it is in a landmass like the Americas. So you're sharing agricultural crops, you're sharing agricultural, agricultural strategies, you're sharing uh, um, uh, languages, you're sharing writing, you're sharing some cultural influences, uh, you're sharing animals, okay? If goats work on the western steppe of Eurasia, then they're probably gonna be tried in Eastern Europe. And if they're tried in Eastern Europe, they're probably gonna eventually be tried in Central Europe. And if they're successful in Central Europe, they'll probably be adapted to Western Europe. Similarly with cattle, similarly with horses, similarly with chickens, similarly with pigs, all these really important domesticated plants and animals that wind up being shared broadly across the Eurasian landmass. Now, because of all these successes with domestication, whether it's animals or plants, what we see happen in Eurasia earlier than in other parts of the world is the establishment of sedentary societies, agriculture-based societies. Because if you're having success domesticating plants and animals, then by definition, your society is going to settle in. And of course, most of these societies settle in around major river basins and river systems of Eurasia, right? No surprise that... Um, the Nile River of Northern Africa 
the Tigris and Euphrates of uh, southwestern Asia, 